Okay. Welcome. Welcome everybody. Um, I think everybody's on mute, but if you're not, could you kindly put yourself on mute just so we don't have any sound feedback while the presentation is happening. Um, I am Linda Marston Reed. I am the executive director of Arts Mid Hudson, and I just want to welcome everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. We have another fascinating episode of the history of gospel in the Hudson Valley. So today is the first day of March, Women's Month, and uh, it couldn't be a better time to hear all about the Black women in gospel music history in the Hudson Valley. So all of us at Arts Mid Hudson are really proud to collaborate with the Hudson Valley Gospel Festival Committee, excuse me, to bring all of these presentations to you on a monthly basis. We're really grateful to the entire Hudson Valley Gospel Festival Committee for their ongoing work and devotion of time, energy, talent to plan and produce these events. And this is all under the good work of Ray Watkins, who's the chair of this committee, and um, Eleanor Levy, who is Arts Mid Hudson's Folk Arts Program Manager. 2021 is an auspicious year. It is the 20th anniversary year for the folk arts program in Arts Mid Hudson. We uh, were so excited about this. Uh, from the very beginning, there was a partnership with the Mid Hudson community to promote and present gospel music. So I am so excited that in the 20th year, we're continuing on with this tradition. And with that, I would like to pass it off to Eleanor Levy, our Folk Arts Program Manager. Thank you for being here tonight. See, I muted when she told me. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight for our second installment of the, of, um, the history of gospel in the Hudson Valley. Um, a little, two little commercials and then I'll turn it over to Ray. Next month on April 5th, which is the first Monday of April at the same time at seven o'clock, Ray Watson, uh, Watkins, excuse me, will be talking about the history of um, gospel again in the Hudson Valley and including his family. But the special treat is we have a young woman, Lyric Small, who's going to be doing the interviewing. She's gonna interview Ray and I'm not gonna give away any more because you're all gonna be thrilled when you, you know, I want there to be that surprise, but She's a lovely young woman that I've been working with for the last couple of weeks. So it's really exciting to start to have some of the youth be involved in these programs. And we're looking forward to doing that for the next, um, the coming presentations is having youth and members of the community facilitate um, with our speakers. Um, well, one thing, before, uh, the next thing is on March 22nd, we are going to have a one day fundraiser on Facebook for the gospel festival mm -hmm. as part of the 20th anniversary celebration of the folk arts program. I'm doing three fundraisers and the first one is for the gospel festival specifically. So on that day, you can go on to the Arts Mid Hudson website, uh, Arts Mid Hudson Facebook page, and there will be the fundraiser there. If you're not a Facebook user, and you still want to contribute, we are happy to help you with that. You can email me at elevy, E-L-E-V-Y, at artsmidhudson.org or info at artsmidhudson.org. And we're going to start talking about this. Ray will put it up on the gospel chat, and I'll start talking about it more in the weeks to come. So we're very excited about that, too. Um, the For tonight, um, I, if you have questions, yes, so we'll take them at the end, but feel free to put them in the chat so you don't forget them because um, we all got a little COVID head going on. So feel free to write them as you're thinking of them and then I will, um, I will give them to Siesta as we go on to the end. So I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to Ray. And now I am unmuted. Can you everybody hear me? Good. Yes, sir. Okay, and I'd like to also welcome everybody that's uh, here today. Um, it's, uh, it's been a, a nice journey um, working with all of you 
And uh, I'm really, um, really excited about uh, what's ahead. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit about um, our speaker today. And, um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to her because that's what we're here for, to actually hear her, not me. But anyway, um, welcome Professor uh, Siesta Little Glenn. Um, her parents were born in the South after her father served in the Korean War. And they moved to Detroit where he found work in the automobile capital of the world. He met and married uh, Siesta's mom. And Siesta was the third child born of five. Although growing up during this time was hard, they managed. There was always food on the table, a roof over their heads, and some kind of transportation. I was given the gift of music from God. As a matter of fact, she was singing before she could even talk. Mm -hmm. She sang in the church choir, school choir, and neighborhood choirs. She wanted to do it all and was ready to move to, from Detroit to pursue her, pursue her dreams. The opportunity came for her in 1967, in the midst of the civil rights movement, when colleges were being forced to accept minorities in their schools. After graduating from McKinsey High School, Siesta was able to enroll into Eastern Michigan University as a music major, where she was one of six African-Americans in the whole department. College provided Siesta a chance to learn and sing all different kinds of classical music. While in college, she became part of a group of African-Americans in the department known as the First Inversion. They sang R&B, jazz, gospel, soul, and blues. It was around that time the department was just getting to the point of accepting popular music and even allowing them to sing their music on this, on some of the programs presented by the department. I do have a, uh, a little, um, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first uh, version stayed together long after everyone graduated. Uh, Siesta left the group when she moved to Springfield, Massachusetts, where she continued singing in a church choir and teaching at a public school. She eventually moved to Merrimack, New Hampshire, a place she described as mind blowing. She was now living in a state whose minority population was four tenths of 1%, um, and, but that didn't stop her. She formed uh, where uh, she was the only African-American in an incorporated Negro spiritual and gospel music. She also directed the, the Merrimack uh, Choral Society. Well, next stop was here. Next stop was Poughkeepsie, New York. And she basically um, has done everything that she did in her past, but more. Um, she's a teacher, she's a singer, she's a student, she's a coach. And she's a downright wonderful human being. And without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Siesta Little Quinn. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. That was something. It's, it's really humbling. But um, anyway, what I want to talk today about, um, I'm going to do a little review. And then we're going to, or I'm going to talk about um, the world so far as gospel music was concerned. And then the last part of my lecture will be the black female musicians from the um, Poughkeepsie area. So um, the last time I spoke, we talked about the great migration um, having two parts. The, the, the black churches established first you using music in their churches that were used in the white churches that they were attending before beginning their own churches. 
the written songs, the songs from hymnals, anthems and such. The second half of the great migration between uh, 1950 and 1960 was known as the golden era, the golden age of black gospel music nationally. Gospel singing groups, soloists and composers achieved a heightened level of popularity through new independent record companies and record labels, television shows, folk festivals and radio. Traditional gospel music before World War II was simply combining a spiritual with the blues, with call and response, solo, background singers and instruments, whereas the, spir the spirituals were simply done um, a cappella. The style of gospel music featured ad libs, falsettos, showmanship and true emotions in the music. This special era of black gospel music went along with the post-war civil rights movement. Lyrics supplied the spiritual inspiration for the real, for the, uh, the real world black freedom struggles and, and commented on, on racial injustices. Civil rights leaders used spirituals and gospels during marches and protest. An example, We Shall Overcome is an old Negro spiritual, but an uh, old Negro spiritual work song. And How I Got Over was sung at the March on Washington, which is an early gospel song. During the first 10 years or so of the golden age of music, of gospel music, the gospel network comp comprised a very small group of churches and singers. The second decade was marked by a national gospel community that included not only black churches, but also reached other people through uh, radio recordings, television, and theater. I'm reminded of the time when I was in Detroit during the 60s. We would get ready to go to church. Um, we'd get up early. My father would fix breakfast for us. And we'd be out the house by 8 o'clock, went to Sunday school. Then we went to, um, well, the young people went to what we had in our church was called the junior church. And then after that, we had to sit around and wait for um, my, I had to wait for my father to finish through senior church before we left, but we still ended up getting home about two o'clock. Okay, and that's a long time. But the storefront churches where gospel music was being played I mean, when we leave for church, going to Sunday school at eight o'clock in the morning, you could hear the music. And when, be, when it got dark, you could still hear the same kind of music being done. I mean, it was just all over. I mean, you'd hear the, the tambourines, the drums, the loud singing and clapping and everything. I mean, you could hear blocks away. Now, <clears throat> the story of women in churches and in gospel music started long before the golden age of music. As far back as the 17th century, slaves of both sexes were allowed to attend white services, although the male and females were segregated and had to sit in the back of the church. Keep in mind, the Baptists did not allow women to preach but in the Pentecostal church, including the church of God in Christ, they didn't bar women from the pulpit, but still most of the ministers in the Pentecostal churches were male. But as in most churches of any denomination, it's the women that are the backbone of the church. Can I get an amen? They are almost always in the, the majority of services. They do much 
of the organizational work which keeps the church going and they play a leading role in the church music as choir directors, lead singers and, and church and choir members. The music that was used in these churches were gospel. So it's not surprising that women have also played a major role in the development of gospel music. Now, I just wanna show you a couple of pictures. This is Marion Williams. She did a lot of um, gospel music and she was recorded. You know, so you can um, go Google it. We were talking about this before the lecture started, but you can, any of these people that I'm showing you, you can Google them and you'll be able to listen to some of their music, what they were doing during the time. Here we have Claire Ward and her gospel singers. This is Rosetta Thorpe and you see she's got a guitar. And that goes along with what was going on during that time too, because when you think about um, in the secular music world, um, one of the main differences between the blues and rock and roll is the fact that they added electronic instruments. And, and you see here that this is an electric guitar. So that in itself would change the sound of the music. You know, there's a definite, I don't care what anybody says, there's a definite difference between an acoustical piano and an electric piano. There is a difference in all the different instruments. Um, the guitar, the bass guitar. I even, um, one of the, uh, when I was in college, um, the guy that was the director of the, the, the first diversion, which um, Lee, not Lee, but Ray was mentioning, <laughs> he played an electric violin. So there's a definite difference in the sound. Okay, um, here we go. Let's see, this is of course, Mahalia Jackson. All of these women were pioneers in the gospel music world. Now, at the same time, there were um, women that were working with Thomas Dorsey. Um, and Thomas Dorsey is better known as the father of gospel music. And um, this is a picture of um, one of them. Her name is Sally Martin. And this is Willie Mae Ford Smith. If you're interested, you know, there's a fantastic um, document um, that I used in the class that I taught on gospel music at New Paltz. And it's called Say Amen Somebody. And it features the life of um, <clears throat> Thomas Dorsey and what he did. I mean, it's really a good document, documentary. Um, and that's Willie May. And um, Sally Martin and Willie May Ford Smith, they studied with Thomas Dorsey and they helped to start the National Gospel Convention in 1931 at the Pilgrim Baptist Church in Chicago, Illinois. Now, so far as the recording of gospel music is concerned, if the recording industry is an accurate indicator, it seems that few women were involved in quartet style gospel music before uh, or between 1920 and 1940. But given the number of small groups that were active thereafter, it seems at least possible that women were victims um, of the time. But this changed after World War II male quartets flourished and with them, so did female singing groups, gospel singing groups. There were, the caravans and you see 
Um, Ms. Shirley Caesar is part of that. And you had the angelic gospel singers. And you had, oops, wrong one. I'm gonna go back, okay? Uh, um, now, remember I'm from Detroit and at that time, um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Aretha Franklin is from Detroit or was from Detroit. And she grew up in a, a gospel-based music singing church, her father being the pastor. And as a young girl, she performed with the Claire Ward singers. Um, and she was even asked to tour um, with the group, but her she was too young, her father said, so um, she didn't go. But then whatever she did with the Claire Martin or Claire Ward sisters, it en enhanced her already gospel sound that eventually earned her the title of queen of soul in the secular music world. And this is a picture of Aretha Franklin. Um, next to her is Claire Ward. And this is, um, I think Terry Butler, I'm not sure. And the, the picture, which I don't know if you can see it or not is her father. Um, Aretha Franklin's father. Most of the groups use three-part harmony with groups backing a strong lead singer. Just as in the secular world, the female gospel singer did not solely rely on their vocal ability to attract attention. As their fame grew, so did the display on their costumes and hairstyles. As their fame grew, so did the display of their, oh, I just said that. Um, it was written about ward, the ward singers. They wore fabulous gowns and they traveled in this long limousine with a trailer on the back that carried their costumes. They would go to different churches on Sunday morning and sing just one song and then announce that they would be back that evening. At night, you wouldn't be able to get near the place. It was so crowded. Isn't that amazing? Now, Sister, Rosetta Thorpe sang gospel at Carnegie Hall in 1938. The Georgia Peach and her quartet sang at Radio City Music Hall in 1939. And Sister Thorpe and the Dixie Hummingbird sang at the Cafe Society in New York City in, 19, in the 1940s. Now, all of these appearances were looked upon with contempt because at that time, Christians were admonished and uh, were, were not allowed to follow the dictum to be in the world, but not of the world. They believed that associating with non-Christians, much less going into a theater would lead to temptation. And if Christians refrain from associating with the unsaved, whether at work or elsewhere, the likelihood they would backslide was, was less remote or was remote. In the mid 1950s, however, black Christians and especially gospel singers began to feel an obligation to spread the word of the uh, would spread the word to the unsaved. The question was how to get the word to the unsaved if the unsaved would not come where the word is being preached. They solved the problem by taking music into non-secular places, turning um, these venues into sanctified places of worship. Gospel singers developed a new attitude. It became a compliment 
to be invited to sing outside the church. And with this attitude, Mahalia Jackson presented her first concert at Carnegie Hall in 1950. In the mid 1950, Miss Jackson was also persuaded to sing on the Dinah Shore show. Miss Jackson was given a 15 minute Sunday show with just her singing. And Miss Jackson was also in a movie. It was called The Imitation of Life, a movie in 1959, which told the story of a young lady whose mother was white and her father was black passing or trying to pass for white in the 1950s. Phenomenal movie. I remember seeing it. Um, very good movie. Claire Ward and the Ward sisters, or the Ward singers, they were her sisters, invaded the Newport Jazz Festival. And so did Mahalia Jackson. This is a picture at the Newport Jazz Festival. What a wonderful festival that is. I've, I've gone there several times and it was quite enjoyable. Um, sitting on the beach, you know, and, and the music, it, it was really a, 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 a nice area to go. And um, this particular song, I can't remember quite what the song is now, but um, Mahalia Jackson performed with Louis Armstrong and they went on singing. It was like over an 11 minute thing and um, they're singing together. Um, so now <clears throat> also something that I found very, very strange was in the 1960s, you're not gonna believe this. There were gospel nightclubs, which opened up in New York, Miami, and Los Angeles. I'll never forget um, while in college, um, I was with the first inversion. We were um, doing a, a, a gig at a, at a nightclub there um, in, in, in Ann Arbor. And I remember walking into the, the club and the music that was playing was, oh, happy day. You know, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed. Now, believe it or not, um, that was playing I, and it, it totally, took me off guard and but the 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 thing of it is is that it was doing just what um they were wanted to do at the time and that is to reach the unsaved now i do remember um looking around um at the time <clears throat> and seeing that um drinks were on the table and everything but no one was taking a sip you know and there was nobody dancing on the dance floor to the song. And when it was over, they started applauding. So I thought that that was, um, it, it, was it was something. So that is some of what was going on in the big world of gospel music and the women that was in it. Now, let me talk a little bit about the black female gospel singers that I have personally worked with in Poughkeepsie. Um, a lot of them um, were doing the same kind of things that um, I just mentioned, but they were doing it on a smaller scale because it's it's not the world, you know, it's it's Poughkeepsie. But I do want to talk about them. Poughkeepsie is loaded with professional musicians. There are so many here. Um, and I found that, found, found that out like in all the cities that I've ever lived in, you know, but it's like everybody's not out to <clears throat> go make a dollar. You know, they do it for the enjoyment. I sing because 
I love to say, you know? Um, so my family moved here um, from Merrimack, New Hampshire in 1984. And one of the first black females that I met in the music world of Poughkeepsie was Miss Marva Clark. She was born in Horsehead, Virginia. An, a newcomer, Marva Clark, moved to Poughkeepsie in 1963. She was playing the piano at the age of three and became the church pianist, a church accompanist at her home church, um, a First Baptist Church in Heathsville, Virginia, at the age of eight, playing for the whole congregation, the whole church. There she learned the spirituals and gospel music of the day, and she played them well. I mean, Mava, she has such an ear. I mean, like she can hear something once and then she's able to play it. She can hear uh, classical music once and she's able to play the whole thing. What a gift, what a gift. Now, um, she began her college degree in music at Hampton University. But then after a year there, um, she moved to Boston, Massachusetts, where she could attend the prestigious Boston Conservatory of Music, earning her bachelor's of music degree from there. She started her music teaching career at Morris Elementary School. Ms. Clark went on to teach music at the Poughkeepsie High School in 1968 offering a music program that involved hundreds of students learning all different kinds of music. And um, she was phenomenal with them. I mean, she um, was a disciplinarian, but she never had any problems with kids. She taught them how to dress, how to sing, and how to act when performing. She taught them that no one wants to hear you mumbling words when you sing. When you sing, you have to pronunciate. And uh, she taught them and she taught them well. She even took, now this is, this is something um, that she took um, two load, two bus loads of middle schoolers to Albany to sing for Governor Cuomo in 1988. Bless you. Eventually, uh, she became a assistant principal at PMS and she retired in 1998. Her first musical director job in Poughkeepsie was at Smith AME Zion Church, where she directed choirs singing spirituals, anthems, hymns, and of course, gospel music. She later became the minister of music at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Um, and there, under her direction, I was offered and accepted the job of choir director of the youth choir and the men's chorus. She was an excellent teacher, and I learned so much under her guidance. Mava was also a choir director, pianist, and organizer of gospel concerts all over the Hudson Valley. In addition to the choirs she directed in the church, she was also the director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Mass Community Choir for years, a choir of all ages that was originally started in the 1990s to sing at the yearly Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebrations. And eventually, um, they eventually began performing at many different programs and venues in the Hudson Valley. In the 1990s, Ms. Clark helped to create a candlelight service, which was always held on the first Saturday in December. I remember that fondly because it was always the um, first candlelight service that I had to sing to during the month of December, always the first. Also during the 1990s, every two years, she accompanied Gretchen Reed singing, Gretchen Reed singing on piano to Europe, 
Amsterdam and Holland to perform before kings and queens. And yes, she, they, she was singing gospel music. Now, also in the, on the Poughkeepsie scene um, of black female gospel singers were the rainbow singers. The cassette is um, um, the music that they recorded. Um, I don't remember the year. And this, the, the picture is a picture of them that was in the Poughkeepsie Journal. Um, I interviewed with Phyllis McClinton Harris and um, she was, or it's in, she told me about her family and all of these girls are sisters. In 1957, the McClinton family moved to Poughkeepsie from the, the, from the Bronx where their father became pastor of Holy Light Pentecostal Church. In the late sixties, the McClinton sisters as they were known at that time began traveling with their father whenever he was asked to be a guest speaker at churches outside of Poughkeepsie. The sisters would sing before he preached. Phyllis, once, or Phyllis told me in an interview that I did, she said, it was a property that's a female spiritual seer that lived with us at the time and we were singing. She stopped us from singing and said that the Holy Spirit was with us and wanted us to change our names to the rainbow gospel singers to represent that God was not going to destroy the world no more by water. The rainbow represented that. And from then on, they were called the rainbow gospel singers. The way that they performed their music was in line with that of the larger post-war um, black gospel music. Harris also stated, um, from the beginning, it was what they called common meter. It was like you make up as you go, make up as you be, make up on your own with only a bass drum that was beat with a stick and we had tambourines and cymbals, but we did not have an organist or pianist at that time. Then later on, Roosevelt Stanford, he started playing the guitar. And as years went by, we had a bass player and we did have an organist, but it started off with lots of food, foot stomping and clapping of hands. And there were no mics. The appeal of the way that the rainbow gospel singers performed spread rapidly through the Hudson Valley by word of mouth and, and through positive reactions for those who heard them perform. Harris further stated, we were busy every weekend, always going somewhere to sing. There was a church, there were church choirs back then. We used to have choir anniversaries and with special marches that we made up to march in on. The whole program would consist of only gospel music. Now, I'm gonna get up and I just want you to hear a little bit of their singing. Somebody said the rainbow's not right. 
I have the CD, or not the CD, but the cassette. So if you ever want to hear more of it, just let me know and I can send you a copy of it. Um, so that's the Rainbow Singers. Now also on the scene was my dear friend, Gretchen Reed. She appeared on the scene in the 1960s. Raised in Arizona. Can you believe it? Arizona, huh? She came to Poughkeepsie with vocal and piano training from life. And she studied at uh, Hampton Institute and became the choir director at Mount Zion Baptist Church in New Haven. Just like Marva Clark, Gretchen was a choir director, a pianist, and an organizer of gospel concerts all over the Hudson Valley. Gretchen was also a member of a female group trio, Deliverance, with Dolores Long and Barbara Riley Davis. That's um, Gretchen on the, the, the left, Barbara and Doris. Dolores, I'm sorry. Here's another picture of them. This was um, taken from the Poughkeepsie Journal advertising a concert that they were to do at the AME Zion Church, December 7th, 1977. She, uh, Gretchen was also a promoter for different area group, gospel groups and she arranged for gospel performance in area churches and at the YMCA and planned bus trips for people to go see um, different gospel groups. In 1977, Miss Reed helped organize the greatest choir music festival ever. And that was at the Bardavant Theater featuring James Cleveland, the Mid-Hudson Community Choir under the direction of Miss Marva Clark and gospel choirs from Newburgh, White Plains and New Haven. Now, um, I read in a, a, a newspaper article where she was asked, what is gospel music? And I just want you to hear some of the words she said about what gospel music is to her. It's not something that you can give an exact definition to. It is more contemporary than spirituals, which were the thoughts of slavery during um, slavery times set to music. The idea of gospel music is the same, but the method of expression is updated. Um, I can even um, maybe make it more vivid for you to think of um, a, a Negro spiritual. One of my favorites is um, Deep River. Deep River, my home is over Jordan. Okay, so you have this very spiritual smooth, moving song, and it's done without instruments. But what happens when you add instruments to it? It makes it a totally different song, totally different song. So um, I 
Um, so then I'm, I'm moving on, I'm sorry. In 1992, Gretchen recorded an album. Um, well, I had the cassette, but it was an album that she uh, recorded, which is what I was playing when you um, first came on. And this is what it looked like. Now, I'm, I'm not telling the whole story of what any of these people, these females were doing here in Pakistan. I'm not telling the whole story. Um, keep in mind too, that they all had families, um, they had children um, and jobs, a nine to five job. But to find the time to sing and to, to sing and do it right, do it where people want to hear more is, is just a remarkable thing. And um, so with this next aspect of, of Miss, Miss Reed, um, I had the honor of <clears throat> doing with her, which was to, she was in a production an Amadeo Production Limited performance of Big River in 1993. And um, she was Alice. I think that was the, the slave's name. Yes, we both of us played slaves. Um, and I was her daughter. It was quite an experience. And, um, but I learned so much just from the, the patients of what um, Gretchen um, displayed. It was very difficult to do, but we did it. This is the program from it. And if you see towards the bottom, she was the only singer that had her name printed like that in the program as part one of the stars. And what a, a fun time that was. It was a lot of work. And I don't, I don't know if Gretchen did, but I know I didn't get paid for doing it. You know, so <laughs> to just say it again, that you do things because you love, you love it. And um, I'm a lover of all, all kinds of music. And I had a wonderful time doing it. Now, <clears throat> moving on. Um, I was also told, um, given the information that um, Gretchen was a part of a group called Divas in the Valley with Charlene Stout. Um, now Charlene is from Beacon, I believe. So um, I have worked with her, but I was trying to focus, you know, in a small area first before spreading out to the rest of the Hudson Valley. And I'm not sure where Lena White was, but she was part of the group. And that was about 2006. Now, <clears throat> there was an article in a Poughkeepsie journal and Gretchen is quoted saying, God is moving my music to bring more people together. And that she did. While Gretchen was a music director at Faith Assembly Baptist Ch or Faith Assembly Church here in Poughkeepsie, Gretchen, Gretchen had a dream of hers fulfilled. In 2001, she was part of, of a committee that brought a gospel group to America from Germany to sing at the seventh annual celebration of praise of praise at Faith Assembly. Now she had worked with this group. I guess she would see uh, these students or these young people when um, she and, and Marva were um, visiting in Europe and she worked with them and um, the name of the program that was presented was called 
let the nations rejoice. This is a picture of the, the young people. Make a joyful noise. This is the group of singers from, um, from Germany that came to sing. It was a great concert too. And so bringing more people into the music, as I said, you know, was, was, was one of Gretchen's dreams and to see it fulfill like that. I'm telling you, anyone that came to that concert and all of us that were part of that concert, um, we, we were just left with, with so much love, so much just full of joy. It was um, a, a, a great experience. So that was the joyful noise. And I just wanna, I think, yeah, this is it. Um, these two students or young people, um, it was a, after the, the concert was on a Saturday and that Sunday we went over to uh, the houses of one uh, of faith assembly members. They had a party for us. And, and I took this picture with, with the girls that stayed with me that weekend. Now, they didn't just come here to, you know, sing. They came, when they came to the United States, they were touring, you know, different areas and everything. So, but it was a wonderful experience. Now, keeping in with that, in 2005, Ray Watkins, with the help of his friend, Gene Williams, Charlene Stout, and Vivian Boone, started the Spirit of Unity Gospel Singers. At the time, it was a mixed ensemble of professional local gospel singers and their mission was to sing all different kinds of black gospel music. They had their own band and they had their own sound system. Um, and many local female gospel soloists were part of the group. And they're still singing today. So um, Ray sent me a picture, but I was not able to upload it. So um, I can't show that to you now. So um, as I said before, before I, uh, or during this lecture is that, or during this talk that um, this, this part of, what I'm doing so far as black female gospel singers, I'm, I'm dealing with those that I personally worked with. And um, there was a time that I had the honor, this was like in the late nineties and into the two thousands, I had the honor of ministering through music with Miss Clark, Miss Gretchen and Phyllis Harris of the Rainbow Gospel Singers. Miss Gretchen, Phyllis and I, we sang three-part harmony with Miss Clark on the piano. We traveled together to sing locally, and we even went to Ma Mava's hometown of Horsehead, Virginia, to sing at her, the church that she grew up in. And we sang at this beautiful wedding in Nashville, Tennessee, um, at Fisk University. What a thrill that was. And just let me share this one thought with you. And I was looking for the picture, but I couldn't find it. But there was an actual um, life-size picture um, in the hall that we were in. And it was life-size of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. And um, I took several pictures of, you know, uh, or had several pictures taken of us standing it was like we were singing right there with the Fisk Jubilee singers. It was, it was quite a thrill. Um, and we went other places, we sang all over town, um, Poughkeepsie area, going different places um, to, to sing. And I learned so much from these ladies. They are just phenomenal. And you know, it's funny, um, when we talk about different voices like what we were 
Miss Gretchen had a, a, a real big voice. Phyllis had a real big voice. Well, mine wasn't quite as big, but for some reason, when we got together, it came together and it just produced such a beautiful sound between the three of us. And the same thing happened with um, Miss Gretchen with the deliverance with uh, Dolores Long and Barbara Davis. Um, all three of them have just gorgeous voices, you know, um, solo, they soloed all over um, their um, good musicians, um, directed choirs and everything themselves, but it's just something so different about coming together and singing with someone of so many, you know, different musical backgrounds, but coming together to, to blend and to put something together that when you're done, people are on their feet, you know, in applause. It's, it's just, just such a, a feeling. And um, I have some pictures of that. That's me and Gretchen. That's um, me, Gretchen and Miss Clark. And see the little babies in the back, they're just sitting there so, so well, huh? Now this was the trio, that's um, Phyllis and that's me and that's Gretchen. But this is, yeah, this is how it was. And sometimes, you know, Miss Clark would even, you know, add a fourth voice in with, with um, what we were doing. It's just, it, just wonderful um, to be with musicians of so much talent and that are able to um, switch it, you know, um, just like that. Like there was sometimes I'd sing soprano, sometimes I'd sing um, the tenor part. You know, is whatever was needed at the time. So, um, with that in mind, I just wanted to 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 say that um, I I recognize that what I have given you this this evening um, is not a lot. And there are many, 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 many more black female performers in this area that have accomplished something between 1960s and, and 2000s. Um, this, I'm, I just scratched the surface here, but um, just know that this will be an ongoing thing for me. And I plan on to continuing my research and um, compile something together that will bring it to 2021. And um, I thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Hi. Hey. <laughs> that was great, that was great. I just wanted to just say that uh, Ms. Clark uh, actually, she was my, uh, we, you talked about Morse uh, Junior High School. Mm -hmm. She was actually my music teacher at Morse Junior High School when she first came. Oh. I'll tell you, she was a no-nonsense lady. She meant business. You learn <laughs> or, or you're going to be told about it. She was a yeah. music teacher. Really loved her. Yeah. I found that, you know, it's like quite a few of the kids that I taught you know, uh, when I meet their parents, they say, yeah, Miss Clark was my teacher. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I, I had some tough shoes to, to, to fill, some big shoes to fill. Do we realize Miss Clark is on the call? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's yeah. here with us. How you doing? Fine, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So are there any questions? Yes, from um, Carla Hotchhalter. I hope I got that right. Um, who do you sing with now and can we hear it sometime? You talking to what for me? I didn't I didn't yeah. hear you. I'm sorry. Who do you sing with now and can we hear you sometime? Who do I sing with now? I um I I do some singing with um the jazz pioneers. 
which is a, a big band group, local big band group. And I sing at church. Um, I'm really not, you know, singing as much as I used to. And I sing at home a lot though. <laughs> well, then this next question is very appropriate from um, Ina Segnet. Uh, she would love to hear you sing one of your favorite songs. Love to hear me sing one of my, what kind of song? Your favorite song. A gospel? Your choice. <laughs> okay. This is one of my favorites. <clears throat> if I can help somebody as I carry on, if I can help somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody that they're living wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. That's it. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. <laughs> if anyone else has a question, you can unmute yourself um, you, or you can raise your hand and tell me that you have a question or a comment. Um, oh, there she is. So Suzanne Gilbert, if you want to unmute yourself, you can, or you are unmuted, go ahead. <laughs> I just had a quick question. I also went to Eastern Michigan University I was oh wondering if you have ever gone to any of the Frog Island Jazz Festivals and have maybe performed there or um, was No, no. Um, I don't think, I, I don't even remember jazz festivals being at Eastern when I was there. I was at Eastern, um, I graduated in 74. Yeah, I'm dating myself, so what? <laughs> But I graduated from Eastern Michigan in 1974. I went there in 70. So, okay. um, and then, you know, so far as the, the school is considered, the music department at the school was concerned, um, the only music that they were teaching and which I had to learn was um, the Western civilization classical music, you know, so. Yeah, I was singing like an opera star, you know. <laughs> Ray Ray. I have a question. Hi, this is Christine. Hello, everyone. Um, this is for Miss Clark. So we always hear about Miss Clark playing the piano. Are we to presume Miss Clark sings also? Yes. <laughs> Miss Clark? Do you have a favorite that you'd like to sing for us? I'd love to hear your voice. A favorite that I like to sing for you? Um, yeah, this is Kayla's mom, by the way. Kayla who? Tyler. Oh my goodness, how are yeah, you? Yeah, it's good of you. <laughs> I don't really have a favorite song. I, I'm a pianist and my singing is not as good as uh, Miss Quinn and the other singers, but I um I'm trying to think of one uh, a spiritual. Let's see. One affiliated with Dr. King, maybe. Pardon? One affiliated with Dr. King. I don't understand what you're saying. A song affiliated with Dr. King, maybe. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on, just a second. Let me just think. I would love to hear you sing "How I Got Over" by my what. I how I got over, you know, my soul looked back and wondered 
You know my soul, look back and wonder how I got over. That's it. Beautiful. Bravo, bravo. Miss Clark. Awesome. So you said Ms. your voice isn't good. That was beautiful. It was. Thank you. Sorry for keep interrupting. I didn't know you weren't finished. So um Mrs. Clark, this is Ray Ray, Ray Sonia. I might be one of the youngest ones on here, but do you <laughs> when you sang with us at the Bardavon? We sang at the Bardavon. Uh, we did the musical on the radio. Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> it was one of my star performances, so I'll never forget. <laughs> You took me back then. Yes, I know I would. And that was awesome. Oh, my goodness. Mrs. Clark, she played the piano. And we were in the middle school at the time. Ms. Clark was yeah. our principal. We were in middle school. So I'll be 46 next month. No. Oh, my gosh. I'll be 46 in 13 days. So anyhow, um, that takes us back a few years. And Ms. Clark, she played that piano. And what was the song that you sang? Uh, oh, my goodness. I, you know, I can't even remember my own name. So <laughs> <laughs> it'll come back to me. It'll come back to you. However, um, it was an awesome performance, and of course, Mrs. Clark stole the show. Everybody was on their feet, and she got the big, biggest, huge of applause. I'm it was fever. It. Yes, it was. It was oh. fever. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Okay. You'll never forget. <laughs> hey, Miss Brenda. That's right. That was, hey. was phenomenal. And the song was well beyond all of our years. And of course, we didn't really know and understand the temperature of the song. But she sure gave a great performance. I tell you that much. I never, Aww. ever, ever forget it. Never. And we have the video. Okay. Oh, my goodness. You do? I do. Oh, my goodness. Uh-oh. <laughs> Include that next month. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that would be great. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have a question or a comment? I heard an um. But I Ray, Ray, what's your favorite song? You're a singer. Oh, Yolanda, how are you? <laughs> you would not put me on a spot like that. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, but I will not be singing tonight. This is about the superstars of Poughkeepsie. I'm just a little fledgling, fledgling still trying to fly. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you anyway. I love you and I appreciate your comment. Good to see you. I love the way she slid out of that one. <laughs> can i just just add one more thing this is clark had a uh, had a choir at the junior high school level uh, when she was teaching at more school i believe and uh, i'll tell you she could probably put them up against any high school and any college at that time you remember that mrs clark Yes, I remember having a choir. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a while back. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. Miss mm -hmm. Clark can't help being a choir director, even when she takes a whole bunch of people out on a boat on a boat trip on the Hudson River. She gets us all singing. She can't help herself. It's, it's <laughs> wonderful to be with her. Wow. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I would like to thank you all for joining us again. Um, 
what uh next month it'll be on april 5th so you can always look for it on the first monday of the month and on april 5th we'll be featuring an interview with ray watkins he'll be interviewed by lyric small and it should be delightful i'd also like to remind you um especially those of you who came on late this is new to you on march 22nd on Arts Mid Hudson Facebook page, there will be a fundraiser, a one day fundraiser for the Hudson Valley Gospel Festival. So um, please, if you even a little, we'll take, you know, a dollar, five dollars, whatever you can give. If you're not a Facebook user, feel free to contact info at Arts Mid Hudson or me, E L E V Y, at Arts Mid Hudson, um, and we'll set you up for a donation. Um, Ray, would you like to say anything to finish out? No, I just want to thank uh, Esther and, uh, and our audience for a, a lovely evening um, of gospel. And we look forward to seeing you again. And by the way, um, we are the, the Hudson Valley Gospel Festival. Um, we're still here. And that's seeing us every month. And we will be back uh, singing again live this fall, all things so well outdoors. Thanks again for, um, for coming out and joining us today. And we'll be putting it up on YouTube this week. So um, as soon as I have the link, I'll send it out to everyone. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Miss Clack. Bye, 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 Baba. Bye, see Good to see you. see you, Ray Ray. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. good to see you as well, and thank you thank for the invite, Eugenia. Um, nice, nice presentation, Siesta. I appreciate oh. it. Thank you. You're welcome, Ray Ray. What's up, Ray? Good to see I, you, brother. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> What's this I'm sitting on? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I know I'd get her to sing. You got me. Ray, you Ray. got me. <laughs> oh, good seeing you. Love you all. Thank you, Ray Ray. All right. Have a good one. Night night, everybody. Have Thank a good you. night. Everyone. Love you guys. Take care of yourselves. I'm going to stop recording right now.